presentation of HBO Sports. You can't define exactly what makes a star. You just know it when you see it. You see the grace of his movement? He is one of those majestic athletes. He's got the looks of a model and he's got the charm of an old country boy. When Jermaine Taylor stormed on the scene in 2001, the boxing world crowned him the next king of the middleweight division. You saw that he had star quality. Whether he had the substance to match, nobody could tell. With two wins over champion Bernard Hopkins, Taylor proved he was worthy of all the hype. But his control of the middleweight division is something that could be lost in the blink of an eye. Wait, wait, Winky Wright! Winky Wright has spent the last 16 years dominating champions and embarrassing legends. But he has done so with virtually no hype. Winky Wright was one of the best kept secrets in boxing. We go Winky, a guy named Winky. Because Winky's best offense has been his defense. Winky Wright puts up a steel cage. Nobody ever looked at him as the next star in the sport. Everything I got, I earned. No one gave me. We took it. Wright has made a career of proving the skeptics wrong. And a win over Taylor would cement his legacy as one of the most skilled boxers in the sport. And with his hardest test on the horizon, Jermaine Taylor has gone back to school. He's hired legendary trainer Emmanuel Stewart to be his tutor. Bing, bing, back, bing, bing. June 17th will determine if Emmanuel's teachings will be enough to help Taylor solidify his title as the king of the middleweight division. Now, after I whoop Winky, say something else. Or, if in his quest to legitimize his status as a champion, he has chosen the one opponent that no amount of teaching could prepare him for. I don't care if Humpty Dumpty joins the camp, they're not going to be able to put the pieces back together again. This is the fight between the best two middleweights in the world. This is the fight that will answer all the questions. This is the countdown to Taylor Wright. Every fighter has a dream. And for Jermaine Taylor, his began when he won Olympic bronze at the 2000 Sydney Games. He turned pro soon after, becoming what some deemed the future of American boxing. But so dominant was Taylor during his early career that fans weren't satisfied with simply seeing him win. I mean, it's hard for me to remember a ballyhooed amateur Olympic star coming into the sport and not at some point facing that question of, okay, when are you going to really fight somebody and try to prove something? That chance came nearly one year ago, after only 23 professional bouts. He put his perfect record on the line and challenged the middleweight champ and one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world, the executioner, Bernard Hopkins. He didn't see that right hand well enough and was momentarily stunned. What happened to Jermaine in the first Hopkins fight, I think, was he was overwhelmed by the moment. But fortunately for him, he was in against a guy, cautious by nature, aging himself, and knew that you know, he had to sort of pace himself. And he was able to keep the fight close enough uh, that they could give him the decision. The winner by split decision and new undisputed middleweight champion of the world. He pulled it off, and the long reign of Bernard is over. I thought Bernard Hopkins won the first fight. Some of us had larger scores than others, but the overwhelming majority of the, the boxing writers thought uh, Bernard had done enough. But rather than spend time debating whether or not he won the fight, Taylor gave Hopkins a rematch just five months later. This time, there would be no stage fright. When I got in that ring, I said, I'm going to establish right now that I ain't scared of you. And if you watch early in the fight, you know, me and him had clinched up, I was just hitting him in the back of the head. Bow, bow. I wanted to let him know, if you want to play dirty, okay, let's play dirty. Let's go ahead and get out of the open right now. And he looked at me. He looked at me like, yeah, Jermaine, you know, um, you ain't playing this time. Taylor gets in a couple body shots, so does Bernard. Unlike the first fight, Taylor sustained his momentum into the later rounds, but still was unable to overwhelm the 40-year-old Hopkins. 
the future of the middleweight division was once again in the hands of the judges. 115 to 113. Yeah. Oh, uh, I was hearing the scorecard, and then he said... And oh. still! Oh, that's what I'm talking about. And still, and still middleweight champion of the world. Hopkins-Taylor 1 and 2 are both debatable results. Somebody wants to come to me and make an argument that Bernard deserved the victory in both fights. It's a listenable argument. Academic, but listenable. On the other hand, six very experienced Las Vegas judges watched 24 rounds between these two guys, and five of them preferred Jermaine Taylor. I still got a lot of work to do, but I did win it. I'm taking the belts back to Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm so proud of myself. If I was Jermaine Taylor after the second Bernard Hopkins win, they raise my hand, I turn to my promoter, and I say, I don't want to hear the name Winky Wright. You could not find two more different paths to stardom than Winky Wright and Jermaine Taylor. Uh, uh, uh. Jermaine Taylor, you know, went to the Olympic Games, won a medal, Came out, signed for a huge bonus, was immediately on HBO in his professional debut. And Winky, you know, had a fight for every little scrap he had. After an accomplished amateur career, 18-year-old Ronald Winky Wright made the decision to turn pro rather than pursue the Olympics. Fighting exclusively in small venues throughout Florida, Winky won his first 16 fights with relative ease. After two years in the professional ranks, it came time for him to start facing better competition. And it was then that Winky first learned that his toughest opponents were going to be outside the ring. I didn't have that big promoter to push me. I didn't, I didn't have the network behind me because I didn't go to the Olympics. So a lot of people was, still had questions about me. Everybody was spreading around that Wink had asthma, he had weak hands, he didn't like to train. I mean, everything was negative, which wasn't true at all. It was only because a lot of promoters talked to us, a lot of local small promoters, and we wouldn't sign with any of them. So they started spreading rumors about us. I called all the big promoters, Duva, Don King, Bob Aaron, but they were all too busy with their big-name fighters. I never even got a return phone call. Winky had earned the reputation of being a defensive savant who had an awkward southpaw style that was virtually impossible to look good against. Many promoters refused to put their promising fighters in the ring against him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Manchester, Ronald Winky Wright. Rather than fight the system at home, Winky decided to take his act on the road. I fought in England, I fought in France, I fought in Germany. That is uh, Ronald Wright. He a feel upon that. Man, I did a lot of travel. <laughs> a lot of frequent fly miles. And unlike in the United States, Winky Wright, the boxer, was an easy sell. International audiences were drawn to see the American technician with the unrelenting jab and impenetrable defense. This is a class act, this Ronald Wright, I tell you. The Europeans, you know, they called me the master boxer. You know, I was beating all their top-notch fighters that they thought was coming up. I'd come over there, I'd beat them. Then I'd come back, beat the next one. And they was like, you know, they come with you right once again, coming to beat our, uh, our fighters. Well, we're almost running out of fighters to put up against you. you you've, you've taken almost the cream of our crop. What, what's next for you? Uh, hopefully I, I can get back to the United States and fight, uh, you know, HBO. All told, Winky would fight 22 times over six years in eight countries. But his international success was bittersweet. We'd go through the airports and he was recognized like a big star. They'd ask him for autographs and then, of course, we'd fly back to the States and nobody knew him. It was kind of disheartening, actually. You know, it was a little difficult, you know, seeing fighters, you know, on TV that I know I can beat and they making all this money and I'm not, but I can't get the opportunity to fight them. That finally changed in 1999. After 41 professional fights, Wright finally got a chance to compete against the best in America. Fernando Vargas was then what Jermaine Taylor is now, the young, up-and-coming, former Olympian that everybody saw was going to be a big star, and, and they were ready to use Winky Wright as a stepping stone to help him propel his way to superstar. This was the kid that everybody said that I couldn't be. So I said, I'm going to show them that 
you know, I don't have to run, that I, I can fight. And he is fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vargas. It's a power-punching extravaganza, not exactly what we expected. We had Winky more or less coming out of nowhere, and in the eyes of, of many ringside observers, dominating the first six or eight rounds of the fight. Winky Wright stunning Fernando Vargas with his ability to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and trade with him. It, it was a, an eye-opener to realize that this guy who had spent the bulk of his significant career in Europe and who uh, had not fought the kind of opposition up to that moment that Fernando had fought was just as good as a big-name star fighter. The challenger, Winky Wright, who unexpectedly dictated the flow of the fight. I always look at Winky, you know, and I try to be honest with my guys. I can't take it from you. We got this. It was a one-sided fight. To the IBF Junior Middleweight Champion of the World, Ferocious Fernando Vargas! And they announced Vargas the winner, and we were in shock. I was mad. I was mad as hell. I wanted, I wanted to hurt somebody. When they called a the decision, and you saw the, my face just went like, oh, I know they did. The worst thing that happened to him against Fernando Vargas was that Winky Wright did really well and didn't get the decision. So now, A, I don't want to fight him. B, I have increasing proof that I don't want to fight him because look what happened to Vargas. He's going to make me look terrible. And C, he lost the fight, so I don't have to fight him. It was a bonanza for everybody but Winky Wright. After his second win against Bernard Hopkins, Jermaine Taylor took his belts and went home to his private oasis deep in the heart of Little Rock, far away from the bright lights and skeptics and his difficult fight on the horizon with Winky Wright. Jermaine Taylor is great uh, personality-wise. He's one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And this has nothing to do with sports. Just a good country boy. <laughs> That's what he is. Yeah, he's a country boy. He listens to country music. Likes to zoom around the countryside in a four-wheeler. All my friends always say, Eric, you're married to a white man. And I because he has this big, super duty truck that's jacked up to the sky. Picture this. You got a black guy with his hat tilted to one side, a chain on earrings, necklace. You just want to, you know, put that together. I mean, you wouldn't write that down on paper. <laughs> but that's Jermaine. Taylor's wife, Erica, sets the champ apart even further. A former starting point guard for Louisiana Tech, she was drafted by the WNBA last year. Though she's postponed the pros for another season, she still keeps up with her game. The ready song, song and pop, I've been practicing, you know what I'm saying? I'm number one, baby. They call me Baby Jordan. Ready? Oh, shit. She's ready. Huh. She's in him play basketball? Oh man. Stick to boxing, Jermaine. Woo. You can shoot out that. Oh no, we don't get that on the <laughs> You missed it to a pee. Yeah. Give me a pee. You got your pee, you got your pee. <laughs> <laughs> you lost. You lost. Jermaine and I like to compete in almost everything. Oh, what you gonna do, huh? We are uh, competitive in air hockey. We have pool, Monopoly, <laughs> anything. Rock, scissors, papers. We are competitive, and each of us wants to win. Game number one, baby. That's the way we do it, huh? If me and Erica's so competitive, I'm telling you, if me and Erica mess up, it's gonna be over a game Monopoly or something. But luckily, when the Taylors get too competitive, they have year and a half old Nia to keep them in line. A little girl. I got a little girl. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm the type of person who I was hard on my sisters, wouldn't let them go out. So imagine what I'm going to do with a daughter. When I was there in the hospital, she was born. It was just amazing just to see my little girl. Just looking so pretty and just, oh, she's, she's amazing. That's his little angel. They just have some type of connection. I, I and mean, not that she doesn't love her mother, but she loves her daddy. I think th this little girl, his baby right now, is the love of his life. And I think having a family unit, you know, having uh, his home, his wife, his child, I think it's really grounded him. I think it's made him happier and it's made him a better person and a better fighter.
For four years after his loss to Fernando Vargas, Winky Wright could not get any of the top American fighters to step into the ring. Finally, in 2004, one did. The thing that saved Winky Wright was Shane Mosley's arrogance. His own promoter was telling him, the one guy we don't need is Winky Wright. But Mosley uh, said, look, I'm Shane Mosley and he's not. Shane Mosley going against Ronald Winky Wright. It's a fight for which Wright has waited his entire career. Against Shane Mosley, nobody picked Winky. I mean, the conventional wisdom was Shane will get him. Shane will get him. Shane will get him. This is a Winky Wright who's come to fight the fight of his life. Wright, seemingly dominant in this round, just as he seems to have been in the first three rounds, hitting Shane hard with left-hand shots. After the third, fourth round, I see, I could look at the look in his face was, man, what did I get myself into? I can't catch him, I can't hurt him, and you know, I'm, I'm killing him with the jab, and he just couldn't do nothing. There have been moments in these past two rounds when Winky Wright is toying with the great Shane Mosley. Winky Wright had the answer for everything, and not only that, he had the answer before you asked the question. And that was, was Winky Wright's breakthrough night. For the winner by unanimous decision from St. Petersburg, Florida, Toronto, Winky Wright! It was a great vindication for us. I mean, here we had gone to Europe for six years. He had fought 22 times overseas and never thinking he would get this shot in front of the big crowd in America and become a big star. Oh, it was like, oh man, finally, after all these years, I beat one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters on the planet. Wright gave Mosley an immediate rematch. Mosley's getting tattooed by leather. And dominated him yet again. And when Winky Wright beat Shane Mosley, not only once but twice, that sent a message that, hey, anybody that had any doubts about Winky can forget those right now, that he is a legitimate, world-class fighter. Wright earned the title as the top 154-pound boxer in the sport and an opportunity to put his defensive mastery to the ultimate test, fighting the most devastating puncher in the middleweight division, Felix Trinidad. Wright occupying Trinidad early with his jab. I did the first round, he threw some punches, so I'm, I'm saying to myself, well, maybe he ain't throwing them as hard as he could, because this is not the Tito I've seen to hit people and they just fall out. Keep busting, you're busting his nose up, you're busting him up. Everything you do, I see it's like, it's slow motion, it was slowing down, when he threw a punch, it was like, so I can get out the way of it. You got every round, you got every round, champ. Came back and we looked at each other like, it's over, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Crowd, as if to say, do you love me now? Do you know me now? Felix Trinidad had no idea what to do from the minute the bell rang to start that fight until the bell ended the fight. It was Winky Wright, 1 through 12. Winky Wright was finally where he always wanted to be, on top of the boxing world, considered one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the sport, and most importantly, in control of his future. It had taken him 16 years and 52 fights and an unflappable belief that this was where he ultimately belonged. Their patience come from going overseas, fighting all them fights, coming here and getting robbed, but still having the patience to show, tell everybody that no matter what I do, I'm going to be the world champion, and I'm going to be the best at what I do, and I'm going to show it to you. The present world champ has come up north to Motown to train for the first time in his career at the historic Kronk Gym, where many a famous fighter has come to learn and grow. But it isn't Detroit or these walls adorned with photos and memorabilia that have brought Taylor here. It's him. Wow, Emmanuel Stewart. Emmanuel Stewart is the best championship trainer in the history of boxing. He knows how to make champions better. This man had all kinds of champions. I can name it. Just a handful of them. You know? Taylor had been trained by Pat Burns for his entire undefeated professional career. But in early May, 
the legendary Stewart was hired for the six weeks leading up to Taylor's battle with Winky Wright on June 17th. The idea for change began brewing in Taylor's camp during the two close fights against Hopkins. I think it's became obvious to everyone that has witnessed his last few fights that there's still uh, things that he needs to learn and that even though he beat Bernard Hopkins in two fights, there's nothing really dominant and devastating. There was a lot of controversy. So rather than wait like a lot of coaches, trainers, or whatever managers do until the fight is lost, Jose Nelson himself made the decision. Nelson, Taylor's amateur coach, who's been in his corner for every professional fight, made the decision to head to Stewart's headquarters at Crump. Pat Burns would no longer be in the picture, at least not for this fight. This isn't a referendum against Pat Burns. Pat Burns is a fine trainer, and Pat Burns did a fine job. But my sense is, is that with a Winky Wright fight being as difficult as it is, and frankly with Jermaine making some of the same mistakes he's made all along, and maybe that's on him, not so much on Pat, but there was a feeling, I guess, that adding Emmanuel Stewart to the corner could do nothing but help. I think it's a very good move. He brings a lot of slickness to the game, a lot of knowledge, and I think Jermaine can learn from that. I'm looking forward to just getting some of his knowledge in my head and just doing whatever he tells me to do. I didn't realize your left hand was so good. And you're working between the gloves, which is perfect, because that's where Wicked works. You're working right between. You're working because he's fighting from the you and you start whacking it. The working that's going to be a whole different game. We've been working with him on his footwork, on his rhythm, and developing his other skills, his left hook, punches to the body, more better upper body movement, and then picking up some more advanced tricks that he needs to learn, we feel, at this stage of his career. It's that bing, bing, and then back, bing, bing. I'm getting my movement down. I'm sparring with a great southpaw. I'm just learning so much from Mayor Stewart. As camp moves on, Taylor is trying to take it all in, from the knowledge of his new coach to the lively Kronk scenery. It's Jim, a champion. I come here, you know, I'm a man screaming my name, you know, make you feel like somebody. You know, <laughs> I ain't never had nothing like this. I love it. Still. The results Stewart can produce in only six weeks of training won't be determined until Taylor steps into the ring with Winky Wright. Here at Kronk, though, confidence is running high. The biggest thing that I've been impressed with is his hunger and desire to learn. And uh, I feel that uh, by the time that this fight takes place on June the 17th, he would be a very, very fine fighting machine who would be balanced out in every way. Winky Wright and Dan Birmingham form the foundation of Team Winky. Birmingham has been in Wright's corner since the moment a 15-year-old Winky walked into a St. Petersburg gym and first learned how to throw a jab. Nobody's been able to break this team up mainly because we, we formed a bond early on. I mean a true bond. Hey, Wink! Wink is just the kind of guy that's real. You know, he's, He doesn't live in a fake world. And he doesn't give a crap about what other, other people say. And there's been a lot of people who have tried to break us up. But it's just not going to happen. Well, I fixed something that ain't broke. You know what I mean? It's been working for us for a long time, man. I'm comfortable around Dan. I trust Dan, and Dan trusts me. 20 years and 53 fights later, Dan and Winky are once again back together training for their title shot against Jermaine Taylor. And as much as their stature in the sport has changed over the years, their plan has remained the same. The American public, they want to see blood and guts. They want to see guys go down. They want to see fighters commit and sacrifice themselves. Winky's too smart for that. Winky knows that he can win. He can look good doing it. He might not please everybody, but at the end of the day, he's going to make a lot of money, and he's going to be able to think when he's done with his career. Winky's starting to get to be uh, a middle-aged man, and he's looking for his future after boxing. He's got a year, two, three years left in the sport. And he's not going to be one of those guys who stays around long after he's supposed to be gone. So he's looking at other uh, opportunities. With his recent wins over Shane Mosley and Felix Trinidad, Winky's profile has extended outside of boxing. He signed with Violator Management, the same company that represents 50 Cent and LL Cool J. And now he can be seen in commercials and music videos. We're definitely reaching out to different endorsements and branding opportunities to present Winky and those different companies join forces. Come on, baby. Relax.
and the first step in helping Winky gain endorsements is to let the public see a different side of him. Tiger Wink steps up to the putt. You know, it's very few people that, you know, you can just be yourself around, you know what I mean? In the hole, ladies and gentlemen. In the hole! Oh! All the fans that know me say, man, you're a cool dude, you know what I mean? I never thought you'd be like that. But because we fight, because we box, people perceive you to be, you know, this this monster, <laughs> some kind of tyrant, you know what I mean? But that's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm the fun, happy-go-lucky guy. We're even. We're even. The main focus of the marriage between Winky and Violator is to start Winky Promotions. Winky plans to start not only promoting his own fights, but also hopes to offer opportunities for fighters who, like him, weren't immediately embraced by the system. Good, that's the shot. Use the jab, though. This fight means everything to the beginning of the promotion because it's the excitement. Of course we're going to win, but when I lose, it's, it sets off the whole momentum of what we have to do. With only a few fights left, everyone on Team Winky understands that their window of opportunity is closing and that their biggest task is at hand. Everybody says he's so big and he's so strong and all this bullshit. Fuck no. That's it. That's what's going to kill him right there. You see that jab? Taylor ain't getting by this jab. That's what it is. He's a boy fighting a man now. Yeah. Hell yeah. The Jermaine Taylor Winky Wright fight is going to be one of the quintessential fights of this decade. It is going to give people a chance to watch two masters of their sport. When Jermaine Taylor puts his middleweight title on the line June 17th against challenger Winky Wright, it will be the meeting of two boxers who took opposite paths to the ring, but enter with the exact same goal. I'm in boxing to show people that I'm number one. And if Winky Wright supposed to be the best fighter that's out there right now, then let me fight the best fighters out there. I want to fight that people think I got a chance of losing. None of the fights that make you become the fighter that you need to be if you want to be called one of the best fighters in the world. At stake are credibility, legacies, and control of the most storied division in boxing. He beats Winky Wright and beats Winky Wright convincingly. There will be no more doubts, no more questions about Jermaine Taylor's place in boxing today. If Winky Wright loses this fight, He's back looking for a fight in the Hague. You know, <laughs> is there any openings in Madrid? The question is whether six weeks of training with Emmanuel Stewart will be enough to help Taylor beat the best technical fighter in the sport. Or if Winky's 20-year odyssey will be capped off by yet another silencing of the skeptics. Loss is not in our vocabulary. There is no way we're going to lose this fight. This fight will be easy and you'll see. The only thing we know for sure about the fight between Jermaine Taylor and Winky Wright is that when it's over, the person left standing will be considered the best middleweight in the world. These are two fighters on the cusp of potential greatness. Winky Wright. Many people view him as the second best fighter in the world today, pound for pound. And Jermaine Taylor coming out of two wins over Bernard Hopkins. This is a hell of a